name is Josh Martin. It should be on this slide. Uh, it is not. The rest of the slides get better, I promise. Uh, I'm the director of Apps Research for Strategy Analytics. And we are primarily uh, not developer focused in our research. We cover a lot of developer information, but we really work with a lot of the platforms, telcos, handset manufacturers to help them understand their strategies around the application space in my area in particular, but also with uh, you know, hardware and, and sort of across the entire spectrum of uh, research areas. So I wanted to sort of start today by a, a pretty simple statement that apps are pretty important, right? They're important to, to you folks who are building businesses. They're important to us because they give us jobs because we cover them. But I, I think primarily, fundamentally, one of the things that we don't talk about as a driver for app growth is that people just like using applications. I mean, how many people here have used an app today? Thank God, if everyone didn't raise their hand, I would have looked really silly. Uh, and we use these applications throughout the entire day, as Giannis was saying during his presentation. There's no sort of day parts, right? We use them when we wake up. We use them when we are in the car. Hopefully not too much, but in Massachusetts, where I'm from, they do it all the time. Uh, and we use them in various places that I will not uh, cite here, but it's something that's with us all the time. It's something that we use all the time, and that's what's driving this explosive growth. So we're going to share some data here throughout this presentation that hopefully will be helpful. If you have any questions at the end, uh, feel free to uh, you know, come up and ask us anything uh, when we're done. I'll try to be quick so we can do some Q&A at the end. Um, basically, what we've done here is look at sort of app downloads to date. And I really want the important thing to come across. This is non-feature uh, phone related application downloads. So you're looking at things like iPhone, iPad, Android Market, BlackBerry, et cetera. And really what you see is that until the end of 2011, actually this is year to date, so growth will be even higher you're getting very close to reaching 30 billion downloads uh, across the spectrum of applications. Now, that's a huge number. Uh, I, I wrote a report once comparing it to how long it took McDonald's to reach the first billion hamburgers downloaded, and the number was like 1% as long. It was pretty, pretty impressive. And uh, you know, if we extend this graph beyond 2011, you'll see that the number grows exponentially. And the benefit of that, of course, is that lots of people are downloading applications. Some of those people are paying for those applications. Some people are paying through money. Some people are paying through advertising. Some are pay paying through virtual goods, as uh, was discussed before, and I'm sure we'll discuss during this panel. But ultimately, the point is, you have a route to getting to a consumer in a way that nobody else had the opportunity to before, and very few will have the, future, have the opportunity to do so in the future. So look at this as an unbridled opportunity to drive revenue. Now, with that, there are obviously challenges as well. But let's delve a little bit deeper into what's driving the importance of these applications. I wanted to highlight how important applications are to the consumer. We do a lot of consumer surveys at Strategy Analytics. And what we saw was we ran the survey in January and February, and I'd argue if we do it again next year, the numbers will be even greater. So you can see across the spectrum of all different uh, countries throughout the world uh, that we did this survey. So it was uh, US, Europe, including the big five, as you would expect, and China. Uh, China obviously being the most important. Applications played a critical role in the decision to buy a handset. So not only does that mean that applications are val valuable to consumers, but you have a position with handset manufacturers and carriers in influencing consumers' decisions. So if you help support a platform and that platform becomes successful, a lot of people make money on the backs of your applications. And that puts you in a position of strength when trying to distribute these applications and become relevant in this industry. In an industry where 500,000 applications are becoming the norm in an app store, having that leverage is incredibly important. Uh, now, you may be wondering, the next question would be, so what happens on the next phone? So next phone, uh, availability of apps on the next phone that you choose to purchase. And you can see, now I didn't do a comparison on this chart, but uh, across the board, the relevance of applications become more important for every single country for next, apps, uh, next phones that consumers are purchasing. So again, it's not just a handset. A handset could lead to a tablet. A tablet could lead to a smart TV or a connected device, eventually moving into the car. I think it's just a very important point to get across that it's bigger than just selling an application for 99 cents or a dollar or two dollars. I wanted to delve a little bit into some of the top categories for iPhone. Uh, we have this data across all the different platforms, but the chart gets very um, ugly, for lack of a better term, and unreadable if you put more platforms in there. So basically what you can see is that games are really dominating all of the platforms that we see today, uh, especially on iPhone and across all the lists. Now, a little bit less pervasive in the free side, Grossing, it's very important, and paid applications, games are very important too. When you combine games and entertainment, you're talking about more than 50% of applications falling into two categories. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is if you compare the pricing of those applications, there's a lot of downward price pressure because A, games generally cost less than other applications and there's a lot more competition. So while games are an attractive area, something like medical applications have the highest ASP on iPhone from what we've seen in our data yet it's a very, you know, it's a less competitive environment, but obviously you need a lot higher expertise 
to get into that and actually make an application that's valuable. So there's this trade-off between sort of the sexy applications that you want to sell and the applications that could potentially be less competitive and drive more revenue for you as a business. Uh, games, of course, are dominant globally as well. So the first slide just showed you everything in general. This is a breakout of the different regions. Now, we pull this data directly from the Apple Store. We've been doing it for the entire year. So behind this data is you know, several hundred thousand data points throughout the year. And you can see that across the lists uh, everywhere, you know, except for maybe you know, the Middle East and Africa, where actually social networking and IM applications are much more pervasive than in mature markets, uh, games play a very dominant role. In North America, which tends to be a forebearer of other markets on occasion, sees games representing northwards of 60% of downloads throughout the year. That's a huge number, and it's hard to not want to get into a market where 60% of applications are coming from. Uh, we, we touched on this, uh, you touched on this before. I think it's a really important trend to discuss is the movement towards free applications. Now, there are good things and bad things about this, right? The good thing is if you have an app that's really great at monetizing a user, if you, sell, if you give it away for free and then charge users for uh, use or virtual currency or whatever you're going to charge them for, you have a possibility of driving a, a lot more revenue. You know, the downside is if users don't like it, they delete it, and you may not get any revenue from that at all. Plus, there's going to be more competition. So you can see over the course of this year, the trend towards top grossing apps that are free has been steadily upward. You can see the top 10 is a little bit more lumpy depending on sort of what applications are popular in a given week. But the trend on the top 100 is pretty unmistakable. You're talking about going from 30% to nearly 50% of applications are free now in the top grossing. If you look at games, the percentages are much higher. It's in the 60, 70% of games are free. So the, the positive part is Ways, new ways to monetize, consumers are recognizing that you don't just have to buy an application to use it. The downside is you really have to make a killer app that consumers want to use and use over the long term. Uh, to succeed, developers must exploit opportunity. It, it's sort of a basic concept, right, you know, uh, to take advantage of what's out there. But ultimately, these are some things that you have to think about because despite this unbridled opportunity that the app market is presenting, there are challenges, right? Do you do... Uh, which platform do you choose to develop for? Do you go with Windows Phone because it's newer and because it's not as competitive, or do you go with iPhone because you're able to monetize better? Or do you choose Android, or do you choose something else altogether? Do you go with uh, feature phones? Uh, universal apps versus device-specific apps. So is it better to sell an app for 99 cents that works on an iPad and an iPhone, or is it better to sell an app for 99 cents that works on an iPhone or an iPad, and then you're selling the, the application twice? There are all these trade-offs that you have to make is, does it make sense to be more useful or less expensive? or more attractive or potentially less attractive to an audience that doesn't have multiple devices. You know, native versus HTML5, this is something that I'm sure will be discussed throughout this uh, conference. I know there's a panel on it later, which I'm going to go listen to because I'm interested to see what they say. But is HTML5 really the future? What are the challenges and opportunities? I just wrote an article about that that will be published as a little soft promotion uh, that we're doing in Fierce Developer that will go out next week. And you know, the bottom line findings are that HTML5 is an interesting technology, but it's always going to be behind native applications. Uh, free or paid, again, we discussed that pretty, pretty much ad nauseum. Virtual goods or advertising or paid downloads, which is the paradigm that works best for your company? These are things you have to think about and figure out because even slight shifts in price can really move an application up and down in the top 100. And ultimately, uh, do you distribute through the, the primary mechanisms like the Apple I, the iPhone store or do you uh, go through a third party like a GetJar or a carrier where a carrier may be interested in saying, well, we don't really have an app store that's particularly useful right now or has not have a lot of applications, it's not unique, we're really interested in getting you on these platforms and, and maybe you can get some money from the developer or from the carrier rather to uh, move on to their platform because they're desperate to be, uh, avoid disintermediation which has sort of already happened but don't tell them that because they might pay you to develop an application for their platform without knowing it. Um, so those are some of the important points I think and then there's one last point, we just finished this report uh, about competitiveness of app stores. So you, we can argue about the discovery mechanism in the mobile space, and I think we'd all agree that discovery is challenged in the mobile space, as it is in, you know, oftentimes on the web because there's just so much out there. But with 500,000 applications, it's really difficult to break through the noise. So what we did was look at the top 100 applications for each of the app stores on a weekly basis and compare how many apps turned over regularly. So in theory, you could have as few as 100 applications over the course of an entire year, right, if, if none of the applications moved out of the top 100, and as few as one developer if a developer dominated the top 100. And what we saw was, you know, while something like iPad won, you know, quote unquote, won by being the most competitive of all of them, you can see that 
pretty clearly all of these guys are falling into the lower left quadrant. So making it into the top 100, which is critical to being successful in the long term, getting recognition, getting marketing, uh, getting free marketing, and getting, uh, you know, driving additional revenue from these platforms, is, is really hard. None of these guys have figured it out yet. So I think that's also a critical component to understand is how do you break through the noise? How do you get above the angry birds of the world and the cut the ropes and the other companies that have embedded themselves in the top 100 and you know, good for them that they refuse to leave and there's no mechanism for improving discovery so that your applications that are new are being discovered. So I think this is something worth noting, something worth thinking about and something worth considering when you decide which application stores you want to build for. So on that note, I am going to uh, let the uh, rest of the group present and hopefully we'll have some Q&A at the end. Thank you. I forgot there's a conclusion slide and, and those are them, but we'll just uh, do that at the end.